Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. The truth is you only become great when you're yourself. Like you can't be like a mini version of somebody else. It's just not gonna cut it. And and like both it is so obvious the minute you walk into a room. The truth is you only become great when you're yourself. I have chills just thinking about that quote that you just heard, listener, from today's podcast guest, Rashida Jones. Rashida, if you're listening, thank you so much for this quote and so many other invaluable quotes for working actors and artists. This is one of the most inspirational interviews that we've had, and so not in a cheesy way. (laughs) Rashida Jones is really talented and really cool and is just as much of an accomplished writer, director, producer as she is uh, actor. Um, in fact, podcaster too, because she has this really excellent, really interesting podcast called Bill Gates and Rashida Jones Ask Big Questions. And uh, it was just such a joy to have her on the podcast today. I can't wait for you all to hear it. But in other news, yes, it is Tuesday. Surprise, listeners. It is one of those times of year when this podcast, as you know, airs weekly on Thursdays. But this is one of those times of year where you are getting essentially bonus episodes. And we have so much amazing talent uh, booked on this podcast that we've had to squeeze people in to Tuesdays as well as Thursdays. So stay tuned for that, for more of that. I have to note also that yesterday was the first day of SAG Award nominating, meaning that if you were serving on the film or TV SAG Award nominating committee and you are listening to this, congratulations, you've come to the right place. But also we will be linking to the first of many uh, pieces that Backstage has written up, listing all of the contenders for the 2021 SAG Awards in every category. Uh, We will link to the one on leading film actors, which Rashida Jones happens to be featured in because uh, these are really informative, really great features spanning the obvious contenders that you hear about every year to the lesser known gems that we really hope that you, whether you are a nominator or just a watcher of TV and film, check out. Uh, We put a lot of work into these, so we will certainly uh, be linking to those. But um, first, this lovely chat with Rashida Jones, who, as I mentioned, multi-hyphenate, very, very fun really personable, really friendly person right off the bat. You'll hear it in just a second. Um, There's a lot here on her process and how even how her personal life informed her working on The Rocks and uh, her different roles as writer, actor, producer, director, etc. And there is primo audition advice. (laughs) Even as someone who has not had to audition as much recently, Rashida Jones is someone who has no problem burying her soul with her worst audition horror stories, for example. So I will leave it at that. Let's get to this amazing interview with Rashida Jones and then stick around for Christine McKenna Torella's segment. And thank you all so much for listening. I, despite everything, am feeling good about 2021. <laughs> Hey, if you are an actor or an aspiring actor, someone at the beginning of your artistic career, and you haven't signed up for Backstage yet and you don't know how it works, I have good news for you. Backstage is offering 30 whole days completely free just for our In The Envelope listeners. If you visit backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope, you will have full access to the site where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start applying to the thousands of casting notices uploaded every single day on the world's number one casting platform. Again, we are giving listeners of this podcast 30 days completely free to try out Backstage. Go to checkout, that's backstage.com slash subscribe, and enter the code envelope. 
If you want to be in contention for an Emmy or for an Oscar or for a Tony or for a SAG award, do as many of the guests on this podcast have suggested and use Backstage. We are here for you. Again, free 30-day trial, backstage.com slash subscribe. Enter the code ENVELOPE. Actor, writer, producer, director, and activist Rashida Jones grew up surrounded by entertainers but didn't begin auditioning until after college, eventually deciding to bring her own stories and roles to the screen. Breaking out on The Office and Parks and Recreation, she then led the series Angie Tribeca and her screenplay debut Celeste and Jesse Forever, and has become an award-winning documentarian. Rashida stars on Kenya Barris' Netflix sitcom Hashtag Black AF, and Sofia Coppola's awards contending film, On the Rocks, opposite Bill Murray. Here is Rashida Jones. Thank you so much for um, joining us in the midst of 2020. Yes, it's my pleasure. What else am I doing? Um, <laughs> well, exa- <laughs> exactly. This is a very unusual year, but also just looking at your like, just from like your resume standpoint, it's an extraordinary year for you. You're, you you were amazing in um, On the Rocks and you're so hilarious in Black AF. So I'm so excited to be talking to you now. Thank Even you. I did kind of luck out in that I got to do these two great things out in the world before everything, sh- right before everything shut down. It does feel kind of lucky, you know? And you have your fingers in a lot of other things. And in fact, I'd love to at some point ask you about uh, the non-acting, non-industry side of things and activism and all of that. But um, how have you been dealing with 2020? I mean, how are you coping? What are you, um, what are you doing to stay maybe inspired as an artist? Um, you know, at, at, the, at the beginning, it was sort of like, it was sort of giddy. It felt like camp, like, oh, let me do all the things and learn all the things that I've been wanting to learn for my whole life. You know, let me start gardening and learn a language and take an online class and watch all these great movies. Um, and then I think the, the emotion of, you know, just missing the intimacy with friends and family over time and also the inspiration from traveling, frankly. I mean, I feel like very lucky mm. in the course of my life, I've gotten to travel a lot and that's always where I find inspiration just being alone, just the journey to get somewhere. It's just so much time for repose and thought and all that. So I haven't had that. I just, I haven't even, you know, I've barely had car time. So, um, isn't that interesting, especially for a Los Angeles resident? Yeah. Yeah. Commuting is something we almost took for granted the time alone. And, and maybe even didn't like, (laughs) no, I hear uh, traffic is as bad as it as it used to be, though. At this, totally. At this point. Yeah, no, it is. It's back. And also, I remember having that one of those early days going outside and seeing just the most beautiful air, and and somebody telling me that it was the best air quality that we've ever had in LA. Wow. <laughs> um, and no, now we're back. I mean, there's there's been good days for sure, but between the fires and traffic being as it is, it's kind of back. There's also been fires. Yeah. It's a lot to People are fatigued, you know, they're fatigued and they're sick of feeling this way. And that's understandable, but it's, it's very, it's in the grand scheme. It's, it's little to ask for people to be conscious of the greater good. And I think the problem is Mm. we don't really, there's not agreement upon what the greater good is and how to, Mm. how to actually serve each other well. And then there's some people who just are selfish and don't care about taking care of other people. They're just concerned with their own rights, you know? So that's spot on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited for maybe a new chapter in 2020. Yeah, me too. I mean, listen, things will be different. Like things will, everything changes, whether you like it or not, always. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We are of course backstage. Are you familiar with backstage at all? Of course. Did you ever like use backstage for casting listings? I definitely looked at backstage. I mean, it's like, it is the, you know, the industry standard and it's sort of like before there was any, any internet, there was backstage. I mean, that's where, that's where people went to get jobs, you know? I do know. Thank you for giving us the propaganda we need. Yeah, no, iconic. (laughs) This is Backstage West? Like you used it kind of in LA or? I remember, I think the first time I saw Backstage was in New York when I was living in New York. Okay. Yeah. So you did live in New York. Was that after Harvard? Yeah. I moved to New York and to, then... to be an actor, like so many. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I did not get any jobs. 
theater jobs. You did not get any New York theater jobs. Okay. But then it became at some point, did it kind of merge into more TV and film? Well, yeah, because I just wasn't getting those auditions. Those auditions, from what I was told at the time, were going to like Juilliard students and Yale graduates and people who Hmm. came out of actual theater schools, you know. Um, And then, yeah, I started auditioning Hmm. for film and television. And my first, the first job I booked, I went in for a law and order, which I didn't get. And I still have regret Hmm. about the fact that I'm like the only actor who didn't have that rite of (laughs) passage. I'll have to fix that at some point. Um, But that, that casting director put me in a pilot. I was a guest star on a pilot. Don't even remember what it was called, but I played a drug addict who had a seizure, who hid drugs inside me and had a seizure. There you go. Awesome. Well, that sounds very Law & Order-esque. Yes. Yeah. Um, But you studied religion and philosophy in college while doing theater. So, I mean, you certainly didn't do, as you say, the drama training. Did you ever feel like, I wish I had studied drama properly? Yeah, I do. I really do. I mean, especially when I got out in the world and I have so many friends who went to drama school who are fantastic actors, but really just just for the experience of being able to say the world, the words of great writing, because the minute you're launched into the marketplace, mm-hmm. I got to say, there's a lot of bad writing and you have to like somehow make it good. And I never got that experience of like really, you know, being able to act the classics and the, the great, you know, the great playwrights. Um, So for that reason alone, yes, I wish that I had had that. That is fascinating. I hadn't heard that. I haven't heard that point before that it's actually the on the job training sort of path, which it sounds like is was your more of your path involves less of the optimal classic best writing. Yeah. I mean, I did take I I took acting class forever from, you know, age nine until you know, and I and I took acting workshops, and I went to RADA for the summer because I was like craving that experience. But very cool. I mm-hmm. think I think that that kind of like deep, intensive training is really cool. Sure. And going back even further, I mean, what was the initial initial? You are the daughter of a an actress and a musician, so your impressions of the industry. I mean, what do you remember about? I feel like for a lot of people, there's an epiphany of like, I could do this as a career. Mm. But for you, I'm guessing it was more of like, you totally knew it could have been a career all along. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody rebels in their own way (laughs) from their family. Mm. And I think my version of that or my version of individuating was deciding early that I was, I wanted to be an academic and I wanted to go to law school and I wanted to be a judge. And I, I wanted to take, you know, that other path. I didn't want to have it easy, which by the way, acting in the arts, you know, making a living in the arts is not easy. But I think because I saw my parents were both very successful and and yeah. lucky that, you know, that mm. seemed easy to me. So I thought I would take like a bit of a harder path, you know? Interesting. Yeah. You had a skewed vision of success in the industry. Right. Yes, completely. And by the way, that's not because my, my parents never like expressly said it was easy. In fact, it was no. very difficult, especially for my dad. They experienced yeah, rejection, the ups and downs of an industry as crazy as the performing arts industry. Yeah. You were aware of that. Yes. It's just that your form of rebellion was like, I'm going to go be in a more industrious. Yeah. And also I think watching, you know, growing up in LA and watching famous people. You just have no choice. You're just an observer of fame, um, not just totally. art. Um, it's it's so bad. It can go bad very quickly. And, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's a town filled with a lot of creative people. And then it's a town filled with a lot of grifters and a lot of people who like to make money off of creative mm. people. And so watching that and then watching creative people, you know, kind of like, um, dissolve at the hands of, you know, whatever the system is or the the machine is and, and having Mm. nowhere to go afterwards or like, you know, that, that fleeting fame and chasing that and being caught up in that and then not being able to recover from that. Like that felt, that felt dangerous. I don't want that, (laughs) you know? Yeah. So you've been conscious of that. And then is it safe to say also that those early years of, of New York was sort of the antithesis to that in some ways in that I love, we actually love hearing about the rejections, the mm-hmm. auditions that really didn't go well. So many. Is that a, more of a wake up call or like, well, in New York, theater is not for me. It's not my path. Yeah, no, it was a wake up call because I think in some regards I did, I did, I was lucky enough to not have that level of rejection up to then. I, I had a friend mm-hmm. in college who made an indie film 
And the summer of my junior year, I, I got to act in a film. I didn't have to, hmm. I didn't have to, um, you know, audition. I didn't have to do callbacks. I didn't have to test. She just wrote me a part. And so I got very lucky in that way and thought, oh, you know what? Actually, maybe I could do this as a job. And then the reality of how hard it is to get a job. And my dad said to me, he's like, why would you go wait in line with tens of thousands of other people for a job? Um, not a bad point. I was like, I, I, I got this dad. I can do that. And then, and then, you know, you go there and you get rejected way more than you get told that you're good and, or actually get the job. I mean, I, you know, I, I auditioned steadily for a year and a half in New York and I booked one thing. Wow. Okay. And that's, and I'm lucky I booked something, you know? (laughs) Um, and so I think that, yeah, the numbers of that, maybe my codependency, I became like, okay, well now I'm going to, I want to change the, my rate. I, I need more people to say yes to me. Yeah. Right. That's a, that's a motivating factor for sure. Yeah. Do you think of yourself, I mean, a year and a half of auditioning, does that make you a good auditioner? Is auditioning a separate skill from acting for you? Definitely. Yeah. It's a whole different thing. It's like, I think it's the difference between, you know, job interview and a job, you know, like I think mm. it's also like mm. a cliff's notes to what you can do on the spot um, and and how you huh. interpret material. Cause you don't even get, I mean, most of the time you don't get directed even, you know, you're sort of like, sometimes the casting director will lead you in a, in a on a path, but for the most part, you have to kind of come in with a take. And, you know, like my friend is always like, so much of acting is about hair. Like literally you walk in and they've decided already whether or not you're right for the part based on your hair color or the way you look. I mean, it's like, yes, you know, so much is decided for you already. And so, um, but yes, you get better at like, you know, I certainly got better at like learning how to, you know, take the subway and leave an hour and a half so that by the time I get there, I'm not like sweating and panting and late and stressed yeah. out. Um, and I have some time to touch up my makeup to like, you know, really being prepared to having a take to, you know, mm-hmm. being polished to being more confident, which I think is a huge part of auditioning. It's like, do you have the confidence to go full throttle, emotional and honest you know, when you have just run off a subway and you're in, you know, waiting in a waiting room with five other girls and nobody knows who you are and nobody cares and the materials may be a little not great. Like, can you still <laughs> yes. deliver with all of those yeah. things in your way? Yeah, the more things in your way, the more you're going to learn, the more you're going to be able to learn how to overcome those things, basically. Yeah. I have never heard this thing about hair. So it's not, of course, it's like, it's How a stand-in, but you know what I mean. Like Yes, but I also think that's really true, especially for women, right? Yeah, and I think at Sadly. the time co- coming up for me, you know, I wasn't, I didn't fit into an already existing framework. Like in 1997, I don't, I didn't look like anybody else who was like really famous mm-hmm. or working. And because I was sort of in the middle, like ethnically and, and energetically, it took me a while to figure out like, or for somebody else to figure out how I could fit in and where I fit in. And most people who cast me, I think it's cause I, cause they were like, Oh, you know what? She's not what we envisioned, but like, let's, let's just shift that a little bit, you know? Totally. It's almost like that's on the job training too, is to learn how those very shallow, very surface level impressions, how to cater those to the job or how to, how to hone mm-hmm. that like, I am not like anybody else, but I, I sort of reference this person or this energy. Right. And like learning how to do that and the rejections point you further and further in that direction. Right. right? But that, and that's, but that's so weird too, because it's like, oh, just really, really conform, (laughs) like do your best. I mean, I think in the nineties, it was very much like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, you have to be this type to get the job. Whereas now I think there's a ton more celebration of originality and like kind of looking and being whoever you are. And also I think, and this is in huge part to like comedic improvisers and like people who came out of Second City and Groundlings and UCB, like mm. casting directors look for people who bring their own spin to a, to a character and bring their own voice and bring their own dialogue even, you know? Because that's the other thing is at what point did you start um, thinking about or really pursuing the, the stuff other than acting, like the writing and the going into sell a script mm. and then becoming a producer and eventually a director. Well, I think I started it much later than I desired it because I, I was scared of failure. 
Totally. And I didn't feel entitled to do that. Like I, I think because, you know, at Harvard, I, I had a lot of friends who were writers and who were on the Harvard Lampoon and comedy writers. Mm. And they went right from Harvard to like SNL and big sitcoms. And, and there was just kind of like a, you know, a kind of like direct line to you are a writer, you're anointed a writer and a comedy writer specifically. And I also had a lot of writer friends that I respected and I would never call myself a writer the same way I would never call myself a musician because I understand mm. the craft and the craftsmanship that goes into being being those things and being successful gotcha. at those things. So I just didn't feel worthy of all that. So I think really it was like like any good thing that happens, I think happens under stress, you know, diamond <laughs> diamonds cook under pressure and... Mm. um there was a looming SAG strike and I was kind of on hold for this show, but I didn't know what it was. And I wasn't even sure if they were going to cast me this untitled Mm. Mike Sure Greg Daniels show, which eventually became Parks and Recreation, but I wasn't even sure (laughs) it was going to be on. Um, And I just was looking at films and I was looking at male creators really and thinking like, why the hell shouldn't I do that for myself? Like, why shouldn't I subvert a genre or, you know, um, do a take or satirize the way characters are written and be, and be my own character. And that was sort of like the first time it, it, I think a lot of great things come out of anger, but I think I was like frustrated and angry at what yeah. opportunities were being presented to me that I was like, Fuck it. and then, you know, with my best friend, who's also an actor, I think we both had had that same instinct to write the thing we hadn't been seeing especially for ourselves. And so we sat down and wrote our first screenplay. And it's like, you're not going to be ready to get to that point until it reaches a level of, of frustration that to really push you to that point. And I also just really appreciate you saying, you saying this, I think it's just, it's true of a lot of women and it's true of a lot of minority people in general, that there's an imposter syndrome, right? And there's a sense that you don't (laughs) deserve yet or haven't earned the title or aren't a practicing this or that because How much of that has to do with the fact that you were primarily an actor and actors are historically not just as empowered as those other roles? Yeah, they're not they're not they're not piloting the ship, you know, I mean, that's that is they're they're given something to do. And and for all intents and purposes, even if an actor is a great star and is the centerpiece of a film like everybody else is, you know, crafting that moment for that person to then have a performance, you know? Um, and I think I just was like, I, I felt like I had more to say and do than that. And not, by the way, I have great respect for, for actors that transcend because you can't do it without those great actors. But for me, Mm. I think, cause I always, I play some version of myself. I didn't feel like Mm. that was my destiny was to just like show up and have, and, and make somebody's movie better. Like I, I felt like I, I probably had more to say and do. Hmm. It's, you don't quite consider yourself a character actor who's there to disappear into a yeah. role. Yeah. I mean, I think there is a, there's a thread in all of the characters that I've played and I, and that's not to say I love to be challenged. And I think like, especially the past couple years, now that I'm like in my forties, it's been really fun to just do stuff that I've never gotten a chance to do. But Mm. all of those things are a part of my personality. Like my characters Mm. that I played on Black AF and on The Rocks are a part of me. It's not like I, you know, visited another planet. Sure. Well, and that that segues beautifully into asking about craft because you are this this on-the-job training of, I didn't realize there was so much New York auditioning for theater first and then more transitioning to especially TV. Um, Do you have a process? Do you have things that you do every time to prepare for a role? Uh, Yeah. I mean, I work, I have a wonderful acting coach that I've worked with since Mm -hmm. I was in my early 20s. Um, And usually I, if it's a part that I think deserves that care, you know, we'll, we will, we have a process. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. If it's not that for me, it's about really talking about it, talking about the character a lot. And I'm lucky in the sense that like on Black AF, I'm an EP. So I went to the writer's room like every other day and we talked about my storyline and, you know, I pitched Mm -hmm. ideas and Mm -hmm. they pitched ideas back and I told them where they got it wrong and they told me where I got it wrong. And so that just, then I get to show up and play that character and it's already a part of me because I've been part of the process, but in general, yeah, like I, I, I take it seriously and I 
with um, on the rocks. Like I, you know, I was I was kind of battling a lot of life stuff. Um, so for me, it was really important to just be true to that, but also to pull from my own experience um, mm. when it comes to like father daughter stuff and my own insecurities and my own midlife crises, like all all that stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which we can get into in as, as, as much personal detail as, as is comfortable. Um, side note about Black AF, because I think Black AF is actually, it's actually sort of complicated to talk about it because it's it's hard to explain to people what it is and what it is riffing off of. But you also were involved with Kenya even before the creation of this show. So first of all, is EP an actor, whenever you're on a project where you have multiple roles, do you think of them as different hats? Or is it all sort of like you are an artist? Mm. No, I don't. They're not all the same job. EP and actor, I think, go nicely together. Um, director uh, and actor, I have a very uh, hard time with. No, okay. That's like a whole different hat to me. Gotcha. In terms of directing yourself, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not great for me. <laughs> I'm I'm very impressed by people who can do it. I and and actually like I think I've talked to a lot of people who are actors who say they're actually not directing themselves in scenes and the scenes that they are in, they have their trusted partner directing those scenes. And so that's that's how Kenya and I always did it on Black AF. Okay. Uh I just find it too hard to stay in that moment if I'm like, you know, watching gotcha. the takes and stuff after the take, you know. But EP is great because I think EPs are are keeping track of the world of like the bird's eye view. And so, mm. and I'm, as a person, I'm always considering how I move through the world and how that impacts other people. And I feel like that's sort of the skill mm. of an EP is like just making sure wow. that everything feels like connected from w- when you're actually, you know, creating the characters and writing and giving notes on drafts to being on set to, you know, and the way things look and the way things are being filmed to to like, you know, post and making sure that the edit feels like the show that you were always trying to make. So that for me feels Mm -hmm. okay with as, you know, as an actress, but, um, Mm -hmm. but the deep, the directing thing is where I get tripped up. It's helpful to think of them as hats for sure. And also, I think that must speak to your personal process, like including working with the acting coach. When you're when you're preparing for a role, you're preparing for the role. That's mm-hmm. what you're really focused mm-hmm. on. And I love this idea of like they are all you're pulling out different aspects of yourself. Mm-hmm. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Is that kind of is that kind of what you mean? Because it's been talked about on this podcast before. This idea of like each character is some people think of it as X number of degrees away from myself. Is that sort of how you look at it? Totally. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Or or it's like a, sometimes it's sort of like, oh my God, this is a terrible metaphor, but I was just, I was just opening a pomegranate, which is like one of my favorite fruits, but it's so messy yeah. and it's so hard <laughs> to like extract all the seeds without like being covered in red juice. So sure. I was like YouTubing like how to open it. But so many times with a pomegranate, there's like an entire skin, like a layer you pull back. You're like, oh my God. 25 seeds here and you feel like so happy that you found all of these new like little this little like pod of seeds that you just didn't think was there that's kind of what like a character feels like to me like an unexplored and unmined territory that's like you know was kind of hiding there all along but then you have this like wonderful opportunity to like you know bring all of that flavor to a character you know that you didn't know you had you never had the opportunity before yeah well, that is pure backstage gold, and obviously that's the the thrust of the article that we're going to write about this. this yeah, interview. I'm also hungry. Can you tell? I'm like, just want a pomegranate. <laughs> Acting is like being a pomegranate, but it's also kind of beautiful. Like, and maybe this is where I can ask you about on the rocks because you've spoken before about the things that were happening in your personal life that coincided with the filming of this. Mm. And I believe since the release, uh, this was filmed long before 2020, of course. But um, you had become a m- Mother, you had a different association with motherhood before playing this character who's a mother, for mm-hmm. example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I had just had a baby and I had just lost my mom. So, like, mother, yeah. all, every feeling about motherhood was um, permeating mm. my heart and my brain. And, and in some ways, like, I was still in shock because it was so soon after. So, um, mm. like, the grief wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't following me at every moment. It was like 
it would just find me and then it would like hit me in the head with a bat. And then I would, you know, like it was that kind of oh, yeah. level of grief, um, which is, you know, not great for filming, but I was with such a like tender, wonderful group of people who just let me feel whatever I needed to feel whenever mm-hmm. I needed to feel it. And sometimes it was mm-hmm. in the middle of the scene and it wasn't right for that scene. So I'd have to go feel it. But that being said, it it made me incredibly present because I wanted to be exactly where I was and nowhere else because everywhere wow. else felt kind of scary and lonely and unexplored and, 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 uh, heart wrenching to be honest. So it made me really mm-hmm. present. Um, and, and also there was so much other greatness to explore thematically with, you know, a woman and her relationship with her career and her husband and her kids and mm-hmm. her motherhood um, and her father and how all those things are interconnected that I, that have been on my mind and in my heart. So yeah, there was a lot going on in me um, emotionally. And um, what's so cool about working with somebody like Sophia, whose world is so mm-hmm. defined and you know, the minute you enter her world, her universe, you know, it's got, you can mm-hmm. almost like smell it and feel it even though it's on screen, but there's something very sort of like controlled about the emotion in her world. So mm-hmm. the juxtaposition of that, you know, I hope like some of that comes across, um, yeah. on screen, but I was like excited to see what I was feeling crystallized in her voice, essentially, because that's that's the beauty wow. of an actor-director relationship is you do put yeah. yourself in the hands of the person whose world it is. And um, ultimately, they are, I'm there to tell a story for her and, you know, hopefully bring enough to it that it feels like it's it's vibrating, you know? That's that's amazing. That's that's the ultimate like depiction of trust between yeah the the writer director and the actor, mm. and it. Thank you for sharing. It sounds so. Um, it almost sounds dangerous. Like I almost wonder if there's an emotional. Is there advice for you were you were kind of you said you're more kind of in shock, but of course when you're playing someone, especially a character like this, where there are you're of course you're going to be drawing from your life from any character that is superficially or any kind of similar to you. So did you maybe in like leaving the set each day, did you have to do a thing of like psychologically and emotionally moving on from that? Um, from that work? That's interesting. No, I, I mean, I, I do think that something that is very much missing from the conversation because I don't think people give actors enough credit is what's the, what's the postmortem? Like what's, how do you disengage from a character? Like yes. how do you move on in a healthy way? Actually, the the great Mary Kay plays, who is just the, the loveliest human being and what an actress. But mm. she she once talked to me about that idea that there should be like a method that helps actors get out of roles because it's not easy. Like every actor. Every actor, because no. it's because leaving leaving a part in a community, even like just a community of people that you're with oh. every day after making a movie, like it's the saying goodbye. It's it's really it's hard on you to say goodbye to all of that Definitely. and never yeah. look back. And then and then you know if you are playing an actor who's going through it, you know I had a friend who was playing a character who was like assaulted every night on stage and every day at like four her stomach would start to churn it was because her yes. body doesn't know she's acting she has yes. to go there to get there and like that's 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 hard work and it's hard on your body you know it's it's in the body yeah i mean luckily again this particular production and this and the way sophia works and being with bill and you know I didn't feel everything was very sort of connected and watery and fluid. I didn't feel, I never, it, I know that feeling of it feeling dangerous. And I think you see some really beautiful performances mm-hmm. when that happens, but I didn't, I never felt in danger. I felt taken care of the whole time. Okay. I felt incredibly safe. And I think mm-hmm. that that is really important for actors. Like, you know, yeah. and I think, and I think to get a performance, sometimes you do have to be okay with going into some dangerous territory, but hopefully yes. you're with people who take care of that, you know? But cushioned by mm-hmm. those people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And as you say, like, it really helps. It sounds like it really helped in this case to have somebody who knows her, the the world that, yeah. she's, that she's going for. I mean, I have to ask about Sofia Coppola because how much of this film is supposed to be, and how much did you think about this idea as, is it a follow-up to... Lost in Translation, because in some ways it is that, 
In other ways, I look at Sofia Coppola's whole body of work and I'm like, what is the common thread here? Mm. She's done such different projects. Mm. So do you did you kind of know maybe when you were first reading the script or first day on set exactly what you were getting into? Like, what did, you, what did she convey to you? Yeah, I mean, I think Sophia's um, touch and her aesthetic and her tone are sort of like, um, there's something melancholic and observational about it. Like, mm. I think, I think, I think if there was a thread in her work, it's her kind of looking at her life as a witness in a weird way, um, mm. through different stages of her life. Um, mm. and in the way that she wants to share, like she's very controlled in the, in a way I admire so much. She's very controlled about what she lets people into, like, this is what you're going to see. And this is, you know, whether it's personal or not is up for your interpretation. Um, but I'm right. going to like, I'm going to drop like my little personal touches in it. And then you can decide what you see or don't see. But, but she does, she does manage to like create this sort of like ineffable mood that is relatable. Like, I think yeah. there's moments in all of her movies, you know, like, and, mm. and the, you see the snapshot, whether it's like Virgin Suicides or um, Lost in Translation or this movie where like, there's a moment that kind of epitomizes a feeling you know Mm. and um and i think it's it's incredible that she's managed to do that because it's infused with the context of the movie but it's also infused with like the the music and the emotion you bring to watching the movie and where you were in your life and i think Mm. she's like you know looking at her whole body of work it's like you we've seen her grow up as an artist and also process her own life and her own relationship with her work um very cool. So cool, yeah. That's sort of another question I've always had is, do you think it's, is this advice for actors, um, maybe when you're auditioning for a role or, or you've booked it, do you have to see every film that that, that, that filmmaker has made? Have you seen every Sofia Coppola movie? Can I ask that? I have, <laughs> but that's because I'm a huge fan and I've I'm always sure been a have. huge fan. Yeah. Um, yeah, even if you weren't working with her, you would have seen all of her yeah. movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I wonder, I mean... It, I think if you're working with a director, I think it's it's cool to watch other films. It just depends on the part. Like, I think if you mm-hmm. are interested in, like, staying in a world that's, like, you know, your character doesn't need to know all that, um, maybe it's better not to see that, you know? It might be daunting, you know? Mm. Um, I mean, I definitely feel like there's been times in my life where, like, you know, when I did Social Network and I had knew so much about David Fincher and had been a fan for a really long time. And, um, same with Mm. Aaron Sorkin, like it didn't help me that I was like fangirling. Like I had to control my nervousness because (laughs) I was a fan, you know? Um, and it was like, it stood in my way. And so like, I had to like talk myself down from that to like try to do a good job, you know? So it's not always helpful. (laughs) Totally. And there's a thing of totally sucking yourself out, maybe especially for an audition. Yeah. If you're like, Oh, I've just seen 10 of the greatest movies of all time because that's what this person made. And like, now I'm totally overwhelmed. Yeah, totally. And I have to say like the times when like, you know, energy, physics and energy is a real thing. Like, you know, I'm not saying, Mm. I think actors, I think directors want to work with actors who are committed and there and focused and honest. But I Mm. also think there is something about like, and I've been on the other side of this too, as a producer and a director, like when somebody comes in and they have a little bit of a don't give a shit attitude and like they could take it or leave it. It's appealing. It's it, really magnetic. Right. That plus a good performance, you're like, I want that person. I just want that person, you know? That's pretty key audition advice, too. The, the fewer f- you give, the <laughs> more likely it's like... Be prepared. Also- know your shit. Feel, feel confident in your take. And then, mm. and then just leave it all there and leave, you know? Totally. That's great advice. What, um, what other advice do you, t- do you typically give maybe early career actors specifically? Well, I think as a writer and an actor, I talk about this all the time with Will McCormick, who's my, you know, my partner Mm. and my writing partner, my producing partner. Like you want so badly when you're young to be like somebody else and have somebody else's career and write like somebody else Mm. and have somebody else's voice. And, and especially as an actor, like copy people's cadence and, you know, their, their, um, ticks and quirks and stuff. And the truth is like, you only become great when you're yourself. Like Hmm. you can't be like a mini version of somebody else 
it's just not going to cut it. And, and like bullshit is so obvious the minute you walk into a room, like people who you're auditioning for have seen thousands of auditions, like, and everybody's trying to cut through the noise. The way to do that is like to be yourself and to be honest. And you just might not be right for the part, but, but like, if you do that, you will get noticed eventually, you know? And it's all practice and all those rejections help as we were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. Totally. Do you have a, um, we ask this of everyone. We have, we have a couple of like, uh, backstage questions that we ask of everyone. Do you have a worst audition horror story? Uh, God, so <laughs> many. Um, also have auditions decreased since, uh, you know, since the office and parks and rec, maybe like since later yeah. in your career or. Yeah. I've had, I I've auditioned way less in the past five years and that's, that's because I, I don't feel very good at them anymore. Um, and, well, you know, obviously I don't have to audition as much, but I still, there's still times when they're like, they'd love to, you know, work with you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say like the two that stick out to me are w one, I was auditioning, I think for party of five and I waited for oh. two and a half hours. And so by the time two and a half hours, which I actually think is like, you can get like money through SAG um, if you report it. Cause like after 90 minutes or something. Um, but I was like. I was just fried at that point. Like I didn't know who I was. I was like hungry. I was tired. And I, yeah. I've, I just tanked so hard. Like I got in there. I think it was also like an emotional scene and I completely forgot my lines. And at a certain point I just was like, I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm just going to go. Oh, Cause no. I just like, one I didn't finish. Cause I just couldn't do it. And then, and actually like one of the last, I had to audition for like some sort of like sci-fi action movie and, I am not a good green screen actor. I need feedback. Okay. That is a skill. Green screen acting is its own skill, it's right? It's a skill. And I, yeah. I, it was truly one of the worst, most embarrassing auditions I'd ever done in my life. And it was the moment I was like, I think I might be done auditioning unless it's somebody <laughs> so great that I have to be in the movie or it's like, I think I could do a good job. I think I'm done. And I'm actually yeah. friends with the casting director. And I was like, y this this was really good because I'm never doing this again. But I love you and I will always love you. But no, I'm never doing it again. Because that's actually good. It's Because one of the things about a really embarrassing audition is then, have you had the crisis of faith where you're like, no one will ever hire me again? It just it just blacklisted me. Of it course. <laughs> yes, of <laughs> course. I was like, director. please don't show. Actually, no, I knew it was bad. She knew it was bad. And I think she even sent it to the producers and they were like, we really love her, but this is really bad. And they asked also, me to come back and to be an established actress, so they know your work. To be like, we like her and know that she was having a bad. I day. know, but that's even worse <laughs> because then I'm, there's something oh. out there that's like a reminder to everybody that I'm that I can be oh. bad. And I was like, you know what? I'm not. I can't. I'm not retaping. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for the opportunity, but I'm never going to be better at this than like acting with a green screen. Just not with like a robot yeah. and like a spaceship. I just couldn't do it. Oh yeah. All those Marvel actors, I do really think of it as a skill. Amelia Clark in Game of Thrones, so random, but she's such an amazing green screen actor because all her acting was opposite freaking dragons that weren't there. Dragon, I know, and she had so much emotion and she was like yeah. a mom and she was, oh, she's awesome. Yeah, yeah she's so great. Yeah. You're right. Like, she should get like a green, there should be an award for like specifically it's for its people own. not acting in the same room. It's like stunt performing. Or it's like its own genre. Yeah. yeah. Um. Kind of going off of that, uh, we ask everyone, what is one performance every actor should see and why? Mm. You know, whether that's a favorite or something you've seen recently. I, I'm like, the first thing that comes to mind is, I wish I knew the actual episode, but there, but Edie Falco on mm. Sopranos, the episode where she decides she's going to leave Tony is one of the most mind-blowing performances I've ever seen. I was like standing, I remember watching, just watching it live and standing as close as I could to the TV because it was oh, such yeah. a visceral moment and I wanted to like absorb it as much as I could. I mean, her whole performance in that show, but yeah, that's something I remember. And then, you know, I just recently watched my dear friend Aub Aubrey Plaza's in this movie bit called uh, Black Bear. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. is a super interesting movie, but her performance... Mm. is so incredible like she leaves it on the field yeah, she she's really leaves it on the field and it's really it's cool to watch somebody you know so well um just uh completely 
just drop all their art organs on the floor, <laughs> you know, like that's yeah. a cool, Ooh. that's a cool thing. Um, and then, um, and then uh, this year I may destroy you like that show yeah. changed everything for me in Gosh, terms yeah. of like how to be a creator and an actress and defy genre and defy expectation mm. and subvert, um, any sort of like emotional expectation from the audience, like everything about Mm. that. And Michaela Cole's performance specifically, all those actors like is not to be missed. Thank you. This is so awesome. Can I ask you about, I, I think of you as someone who's, who's very much got your finger on the pulse of the industry, which has gone through not just this year. I'm thinking about the, you know, Hollywood in general, Mm. uh, a couple years ago with times up or, this year there has been this year but just more and more there's a renewed focus on representation in media mm. and racism even in the industry you know what what would you say is the state of the industry in 2020 are what are your what are the reasons for hope <laughs> and then what else can we do can what else can i do and what can specifically actors do well you know i guess the good and bad news is i think the state of the industry is in flux yeah. A lot of transition. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we're all sort of grieving this idea that uh, movies and movie theaters are less and less um, like how how things are released. Um, yeah. But there's way more content. So that's really great. And also mm-hmm. there's an opportunity right now to storytell from all different places that never got attention before. So that's Hmm. incredible in terms of representation. You're just going to get, it's like, it's like on trend right now for studios and networks to buy stories that are kind of outlying stories of people that haven't had a voice before. So that's really good. I hope it's not a trend. It should stick. Um, But I also, my biggest concern is that the people who are at the very top of the pile in this business they don't really care about the day-to-day, like they don't care about the working class actor and they don't care about the working class writer. And they don't, meaning like, Mm. you know, there's a whole, there's a whole middle class of performers and creators that are not benefiting from these huge deals that you're seeing across the board. And, Mm. you know, those, those people are the fabric of the industry, those people and the crew behind the scenes and in front of the camera. And, I'm concerned that we are so excited about the gold rush of opportunity that's coming in mm. with tech that we are missing the fact that they that an entire industry that kind of doesn't give a shit about art and is really about tech is is calling the shots. That's my mm. concern. That's the, what I think we keep our eye on. Um, like mm. these great deals and this great representation, like beware because... Mm-hmm. I, I just, I, I just am concerned about what that will do to the, to the business at large mm-hmm. when we give and away. Where is the advice? Yes, yeah. it it's important to just keep having these conversations and like keeping an eye on it. Yes, and I had not thought of it as working class, like a middle class of yeah. artists that I think also kind of reflects what's happening in the country. Where absolutely also in our country, there's a lot of people at the top that are remaining at the top. And right. Yes. Right. Like people. And by the way. <laughs> Lest, lest we forget that tech billionaires have gotten richer during the pandemic, yeah. richer, yeah. doubled and their a wealth. And a like pandemic. that is that's problematic. And even if they do create jobs, and even if they do create opportunities, and they do seem to be champions of diversity, they're still mm. hoarding all the money. You know. Yeah, that's why you feel distrustful of those kinds of um, of their of their motives because the proof is in the pudding. Exactly. If they're getting richer. Then- exactly. So that's, and that's obviously like, you know, when it comes to acting jobs, it, that feels like way far away from where you're, where the thinking is, but I think as an industry, right. it's going to be our biggest challenge is how do we, how do we survive? Like, I, I still don't understand why we don't all just like own our own stuff. Like, yeah. you know, there was United Artists, like, where's our version of that? Where is mm. like, that's my call to arms is like, own your content. I don't know how that yeah. happens. I don't know how we do it, but it does feel like artists should be funding their own work and benefiting from become... their own work. And then I would say, you know, just, just on a day to day, uh, in a day to day way, you know, just continue to protect each other and advocate for each other. Like I think set is a very weird place where, 
um, lines mm. are blurred. And I think the reason, you know, Me Too was successful was because people got to line up and support each other um, as they said mm. things out loud that were scary and they felt like we're going to ruin their lives and their careers. Mm. So yeah. we can't be afraid to speak up because we feel like we're going to be unpopular or we're not going to get cast again or we're not going to get jobs again. Like we have to keep pointing to what's mm. wrong. And like, you know, I will privately say to my friends and hopefully publicly someday, like, Hey, like how do, how does everybody feel about taking these giant deals from tech companies? Like we do realize that, you know, there's some problems there, right? Like as mm. creators, because you know, you have to say something. Um, and then similarly, you know, with, with exploitation and, you know, mm -hmm. and a power dynamic exploitation, you have to continue to say something. It's not okay just because it's the standard. Like it's yeah. okay to be like, Hey, you know, what's not cool is that. And like, yeah, let me say something and let me find a friend and they can hold my hand and let me say something. Mm. That's a great, that's a great way of putting it. Cause it is an industry that isn't necessarily structured and designed to encourage that. It, not, not only that, it's structured and designed to make sure that doesn't happen. I mean, the entire yeah. <laughs> industry was created to keep women in their place of being trophies and, yep. and, and shutting up basically. So, you yeah. know, it's that, that's unfortunately, that's our legacy. We have to, now we can fix it. We can fix it. Yes, and change is very incremental, and there I think there is something to be said for this this year of craziness. This this year of um, things have to be in flux. That is the time to say something and to propose new norms, right? Yeah, it should be. I mean, it definitely should be. But I, it's going to be interesting to watch what productions right now. Everybody's so focused on saying on staying COVID safe that mm -hmm. it will be interesting when that is not the first thing that's important like can we can yeah. we finally have a real code of conduct around sex scenes and in, in intimacy yeah. that that where yeah. actors feel protected and looked after because yeah. they don't have it and unfortunately no, it's just not there right now no we're getting there i feel like even four or five years ago that was never even part of the conversation true at least now it's yeah um there's also maybe going to be a weird phenomenon where like a lot of people have been writing and not in production, you know, not turning that into production yet. So there's also this thing of like the floodgates could open. And again, that is the time to set new norms, to like, to implement the changes, the the stuff that we like from 2020 and like, keep it going. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I, that's very positive. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. This, I really think that this interview, I really think everything that you've provided listeners is is step in that that direction. It is a guide in in the direction of like good progress in the industry. I hope um, so. Are there other resources that we should that we should link to or that we should shout out? Your podcast with Bill Gates is extraordinary and and thank you. Quite random. It's so random. I know the most <laughs> random pairing of 2020. It feels very 2020 yeah. in that way. Sure. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we have just kind of scratched the surface, but we talk about, I, I'm very interested in moving into 2021 in like creating a culture for conversation. I feel like I'm, I'm very tired mm -hmm. of everybody shouting into an echo chamber and I'm very tired of, um, trial by social media and I'm very tired mm -hmm. of people ignoring nuance and, uh, and evidence based facts and, um, mm. and reason like we worked so hard to get here. Humanity worked so hard to get here. Like let's use it to respect each other. Stay curious, like stay open and curious. You don't know in everything. And this American sensibility that like the individual is the most important thing and the individual rights yeah. is the most important thing. Like let's lean on each other to get better and learn more yeah. and from each other and have healthy, de respectful debate. Oh, awesome. What a perfect <laughs> note to end on. Thank you. I could talk to you for hours. This is so awesome. <laughs> yeah, Thank it was you. so fun. Thank you.
And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hi, guys. Christine McKenna Torella here. Our guest was very generous in sharing her examples of how she's bombed in auditions. It's easy to think that someone like Rashida Jones, who has a super successful acting career, hasn't ever had a bad day at work, right? But on the road to mastering a skill like auditioning, everyone will start somewhere and everyone will have learned and grown through a challenging experience or two. Let's talk about how to bounce back after a disappointing audition. This is going to be in two parts. Today, we'll chat about things you can do while you're in the live audition. And next episode, we'll deal with what to do afterwards. So first of all, I always, recurring theme, I talk about this a lot, prepare and ask as many questions as you can before you get in the audition room. The audition starts before you even leave your house in the morning for the audition, right? When you know you've prepared, you know you've done your best, you've done all you can to control the audition, you can leave all the work in the room. And when you know who's in the room, whether you'll be asking to be improvising or reading something cold or learning a short piece of choreo after you've read your first piece, knowing exactly what might happen in the audition room will help you stay on top of your game during the audition. If you are mid-audition and nerves get the best of you, stop, take a breath and ask the casting director to start again. The answer is going to be yes, nine times out of ten. We'd all prefer you stop, start again, then continue with an audition that doesn't feel like it's going well. No one wants to see you bomb, right? No one wants to see you not be at your best. Don't apologize or draw more attention to what's going on. It's okay to mess up. It's an audition. It's not opening night. The casting team will know you're nervous. That's to be expected. So don't get in your head in the audition room. Try to stay flexible And don't prejudge why you're being asked to do something. An audition gives the director and the producers a window to how you'll work in a rehearsal-like setting. You won't be expected to be perfect in rehearsal and new ideas will be presented to you. So if you receive feedback in the audition space to read the sides in a completely different way, it doesn't mean that you haven't done it right the first time. There's no right and wrong. It just means that they want to see something different. They want a different interpretation. Don't judge yourself and defeat yourself mid-audition. And in that audition room, keep in mind the casting director wants you to succeed. I want you to book the job. I want you to make me look good. We are on your side. Next episode, we'll explore what action to take after that disappointing audition and how to move forward and onward. On to some casting calls. An exciting voiceover casting for an unnamed video game. It's got professional pay. They're looking for French, Spanish and German accents. The artist must be based in the UK because they're shooting there, details on the site. A really great brand spot for Moroccan oil. They're seeking male model types willing to get their hair cut for the job. It's based in New York, shoots in person, more details on the site. That's all from me for now. Break a leg in all your upcoming auditions and have a beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.